bom dia a todos. Uh, sejam bem-vindos à, à aula de hoje. Uh, good morning to everyone. Welcome to this morning's class. It's great to have you back. And uh, it's an immense pleasure to welcome our um, uh, guest uh, speakers for today. So um, I'd like to welcome Nancy uh, Pitakov, who is an activist of the Homeless Workers Movement, the MTST. Uh, she's been uh, in, the, in the organization since 2018, and she works in the political formation sector. She coordinates the program Bahaku, uh, a live stream that debates academic works about the MTST and groundwork with popular thinkers and educators. She's a journalist with a degree from the School of Communication and Arts of the University of São Paulo, ECA in USP, uh, writer and script writer. She has worked in the areas of corporate communication, public relations, and currently works in independent journalism. So it's great to have you here, Nancy. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to bring the MTST a point of view, experience, perspective to this class. And I'd like to thank, uh, uh, welcome uh, and thank uh, Professor Munir Noseba. Uh, he's a human rights lawyer and academic based uh, at Al-Quds University, Jerusalem. Uh, Thank you very much for accepting this the invitation, Munir. He's an assistant professor at al Quds University's Faculty of Law, the director and co-founder of al Quds Human Rights Clinic, um, the first accredited clinical legal education program in the Arab world, and the director of the Community Action Center in Jerusalem. Uh, he holds a BA degree in law from al Quds University and LM, LLM in, in International Legal Studies from the Washington College of Law of the American University in Washington, D.C., and a PhD degree from the University of Westminster in London, UK, where he acquired after uh, successfully, which he acquired after successfully defending his, type, his thesis entitled Forced Displacement in the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, International Law and Transitional Justice. Uh, so, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for attending this class. Basically, the idea is that you will present your experiences and point of view uh, all around uh, forced displacement, ethnic cleansing. Nancy will begin speaking about the MST experience uh, in Sao Paulo. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. First of all, I'm very grateful for Aline's invitation. I also thank the presence of all of you. My English is not exactly fluent, so I will try my best to be understood. It's kind of rusty. For this, I have Lorenzo here with me, a colleague from my sector, to help me with doubts and blackouts. And well, as I did not uh, follow an academic career, for, for I am a journalist, my presentation will be more, more of a report, okay? And I'm here representing the Homeless Workers Movement of Brazil, Movimento dos Trabalhadores Sem Teto, MTST. In this presentation, I will refer to the movement through its acronyms, acronym MTST, or simply the movement. I am, I am a part of the its political, forma, uh, its political formation sector, as Arlene said. In the last class, you talked to Cassia Bechara of MST, correct? Well, the MTST was born from a strategy of the M MST to start uh, taking part in the urban struggle. Can you pass this slide, please? Before we talking, before talking, uh, the beginning of the M M MTST and presenting a short, short history of the movement, let's talk about the struggle for housing. In Brazil, many rights are denied and housing is among the main ones. Housing or the lack of security of a large part of the population in relation to having a place to live and that is an expensive demand and an important mobilizing factor. We don't have recent updated statistics for the Brazil for Brazil today, but the housing deficit is estimated 
to reach more than 10% of the population. This means about 20 million people who effectively need a roof over their heads. How do all these people live? Obviously, not all of them live on the streets. Homeless people have reached the limit of exclusion caused by unemployment, lack of decent housing, and mental illness caused by lack of opportunities. Most of the homeless in Brazil are not living on the streets, but they are workers, even if informally and without legal rights. And next, please. And who are the homeless? Most of them, including those who are in the movement, are people who live with relatives. Let's take an example. Ejani Maria is a member of the MS MTST, and she was elected for a legislative seat uh, in the state of Sao Paulo last year, nine, uh, 2022. And she still lives in the back of her mo former mother's-in-law house with four children. And next. And the second group come as, and those who spend too much on rent. This is, that is, who stop buying food and other basic needs to be able to pay the rent and not live on the streets. This is a common situation. There is also a part that lives in poor constructions, slums, and tenements. With such a large number of people in insecure situations, housing is, the is a necessity that attracts people to the political struggle. Now, let's see how the MTST started and what are its methods. Uh, can you pass? Thank you. In 1994, President Fernando Henrique Cardoso was elected. Uh, he advanced the implementation of a neoliberal economic policy, with, which began to deepen social inequality and poverty. In this period, the EMST also started to organize urban workers in the struggle for better living conditions. Thus, in 1997, the MTST emerged as a as the urban branch of the Euro MST. The first occupations of MST, MTST took place in Campinas, Guarulhos, and São Bernardo, do, São Bernardo do Campo, cities in the state of São Paulo, close to the capital and close to the, uh, the highways. In 2000, President Cardoso, or FHC, FHC, as we say here, issued an anti-invasion measure, which forbade the evaluation and inspection of occupied lands and excluded rural workers who took part in these occupations in the countryside from the land reform program. He stopped it, uh, the land reform program for these people. And uh, what about housing in this, in this period? There are no housing programs capable of meeting the demands of the poorest people. Next. How did we fight in this period? Besides occupying areas in cities close to the capital of Sao Paulo, we used to do the urban barricade, that is, we used to block the highways. The idea was to affect power and capital, preventing goods from reaching the city. That is why the occupations took place the, in the, on the outskirts of the metropolis. So in tw uh, 2023, the ruling party in Sao Paulo, uh, the right-wing PSDB, understood the strategy of the MTST and retaliated violently 
carrying out truculent repossessions of occupied land. Because of these evictions, in 2004, the MTST had lost all its occupations and felt the need to change its methods of fighting for housing. Um, next, please. Thank you. President Lula had been elected two years before, in 2002. The workers were euphoric. They believed that, the popular, that a popular government and a president coming from the people could, uh, could combat homeless, homelessness, finally. In 2005, the MTST reborn with the Chico Mendes occupation, gathering 800 families. Through the new experience of this occupation, the movement has managed to accumulate strength to continue the struggle, independently of concentration of people in a specific plot of land. Thus, even after eviction, people would remain organized in order to claim their rights to housing. Uh, next, please. And what about the houses? The, gov the federal gover government program, Minha Casa Minha Vida, or My House, My Life, was born in 2009. However, the movement needed to fight so that the program would include those who could not pay for housing under the rules of the real, real estate market. The struggle of the NTST and other movements has forced the government to grant subsidies so that the poorest people could also get a house by paying only what, only what would fit in their budget. The first conquest has taken place in 2014 with the construction of the João Cândido Condomínio, which was the result of an occupation that arose in 2007. Through a subpart of that government program, My House, My Life, Entities. Uh, next, please. And after the Arab Spring in 2010 and Occupy Wall Street in 2011, in Brazil, we had, uh, we had the June protests, which took place in 2013. At this time in Brazil, the Workers' Party government was building a lar uh, large projects for the Olympic Games and Soccer World Cup even expropriating several low-income communi communities. This had consequences for the real estate market. The valorization of the central urb urban regions caused a displacement of the poorest population to even more per peripheral regions. And even in these areas, rents were rising sharply. In Sao Paulo, the average the average price of the real estate much multiplied almost threefold in five years. Rents almost doubled in the same pe period. Meanwhile, the construction of low-income housing was paralyzed. Next, please. What changed for the MTST? As I have said, large mobilizations have taken place in Brazil in 2013. First, starting from protests against the rise of the bus fare in Sao Paulo. People from different social classes started to see the streets demonstrations as a space for their demands and agendas, both from the left and the right. Because of the combination of dissatisfaction and the difficulty of paying rent, the periphery also has taken part of the struggle. 
in its own way by occupying empty lots in remote neighborhoods. At this moment, the MTST took advantage of the political effervescence and the people's revolt. So it started new occupations all over Brazil. Before 2013, there was a rhythm of three to five occupations per year, but there were more than 10 occupations in 2013 alone. The MTST also organized demonstrations that, que that questioned the staging of the soccer of the soccer world cup in order to point out the lack of public policies for the most needed at this time the movement began to be recognized all over um, the country and out of the country too in is it is in this contest that mtst occupied the land for the first time in the capital of São Paulo, including the occupations Faixa de Gaza and Vila Nova Palestina. Only the occupations Vila Nova Palestina in the Jardim Angela neighborhood, located at the extreme south of São Paulo, more than 8,000 families have joined the struggle. I will say more about the occupation in a while. And next. But why is occupying a method for the MTST? The Brazilian constitution was promulgated in 1988 after the end of the civil military dictatorship and the re-democratization. It includes in Article 5, in short, the Constitution assures the right to private property. However, in subsection 23, it states, property shall serve its social function. That is, a landowner cannot keep land or building without use under the terms, the terms of the law. So, in subsection 24, we have the rules for expropriation. It means that the government is the government, go, government that must expropriate and compensate the owner. In practice, what happens is that expropriations would never happen without pol political pressure from the people organized in occupations that flag land that does not fulfill its social function. All the achievements of the MTST and of the MST are the result of occupations, demonstrations, protests, and years of negotiation and the struggle for, of the landless and the homeless. Um, next. And why do we call occupations New Palestine Village and Gaza Strip? In 2012 and 2013, Brazilian diplomacy began to support the Palestinian state. At this time, the leftist social movements, which already saw the Palestinian struggle as a sister struggle, began to make this support explicit in their symbols. The MTST usually baptizes its occupations with names of historical Brazilian fighters. But it felt natural in that moment that the Palestinian struggle would be honored. I show here an example of this. And this is a commemorative publication in Occupations Residents Group, which happened precisely on the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. 
Today, November 29, is the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. Six, six years ago, tonight, the Villa Nova Palestina occupation was born an MTST occupation that received this name in solidarity with the with and in honor of the Palestinian resistance. There is still too much to conquer, many battles to win, and the, a beautiful history of struggle to be written. The struggle has no borders. Free Palestine, long live Villa Nova Palestina. Today, the residents live in great anxiety because the disputed land has been declared a social interest zone since 2016. The previous mayor committed to starting construction this year, 2023. Now, the current mayor wants to draw off on what had already been negotiated. So they are very anxious. But I think you will better understand our struggle from the words of our own, our own militants and residents of the occupation. I have brought here one video of them for this presentation. Thank you very much. And I will ask for Vitoria to pass the film. And thank you for the, the listen. A gente está tudo amarrado uhum. e tudo dê certo. Onde você morava antes da Vila Nova Palestina? Vila Calu, pagava aluguel. O que mais falta para você hoje? A moradia própria. O momento que a gente foi para a Nova Palestina é, é construção mais rápido possível para que saia as nossas casas, né? Uhum. Porque por pagar aluguel que nós estamos morando aqui. Entendeu? O mais rápido possível a liberação da construção das casas. É, tem, tem a casa, as casas, né? As casas pra gente morar. Liberação da construção. Da construção, isso. O que mais falta para o senhor hoje? Emprego e moradia. Hum. O que você sabe para ver uma, uma Palestina hoje? É que eles adiantam logo o. Ao... As construção da moradia. São Paulo é a cidade do cachorro, é uma cidade sem dó, entendeu? É uma cidade que quem. quem... Comanda é, é os governantes e os patrões. Não tem, não tem para pra gente, a gente não tem chão. Estava tendo a ocupação no Valo Velho, na João Cândido. A mãe passou e falou assim: olha, você gosta de fazer teatro e você está aqui se acabando. Vai lá para dentro ajudar o pessoal. Eu não entrei. Na, na, na época não entrei por moradia. É, mesmo não ter onde ficar, acabar de, de separar, não sei onde ficar. E voltei para casa da minha mãe que morava no aluguel. Eu fui para dentro 
dentro da ocupação, mas para um escape mesmo, para não, não, não ir para o lado errado. E fiquei. Aí, depois de um... Eu estava com uma semana, entrei para a coordenação do movimento. Uma semana de movimento. Aí foi que eu comecei a fazer luta para colocar minha mãe em um lugar. Tentando aproveitar que eu já estava na luta por moradia. Aprender como, como é que funcionava. Porque eu vim de uma família que não, não aceita a ocupação, a invasão, não aceita isso. Meu pai principalmente. Mas meu pai não aceita, minha mãe paga aluguel. Eu falei alguma coisa coisa errada, né? Eu sei que meu pai sempre procurou ensinar o caminho certo, mas ele também não sabia de tudo. Então, eu vi que o caminho que eu tava é, dava para conquistar alguma coisa. Não é dado, não é de graça. A gente tem que lutar muito. Todos os dias viver na luta. E graças a Deus hoje minha mãe está dentro do apartamento dela, está pagando, mas está dentro do apartamento dela com essa luta do mundo. Não tem como não lutar. Né? É, é aceitar uma luta com dignidade, uma luta melhor, porque pobre não tem como não nascer e não lutar. A gente luta para sobreviver. Luta para comprar o pão, luta para pagar pegar o aluguel, luta para pegar um ônibus, luta para voltar para onde quer que seja, mesmo que não seja nosso, mas a gente luta para voltar para nossa família. Então, a gente nasce lutando, porque é negado não só moradia, não é negado só saúde, transporte, mas é educação também. A gente é muito privado de educação, então às vezes a gente não sabe lutar por não ter educação não ter uma educação de qualidade para saber os caminhos da lei que a gente possa fazer com que isso funcione o, o, o meu sonho é que já era para ter acontecido né? que fosse cumprido o que o, que o Haddad é, assinou e a, a, a Vila Nova Palestina quando a gente foi para lá, ela tinha, ela tem um milhão de metros quadrados. É, é uma área da uma faixa da Guarapira e na faixa ali tem somente 10% que era liberado para moradia. É, no governo da se não me engano, em 2014, a gente conseguiu conseguiu transformar numa área de seis e, e, e que passasse para moradia 30% por em torno de 300 mil metros quadrados da área. O equivalente a 3.500 apartamentos. Gente, não é muito, não é muito o que precisa de moradia. O povo precisa Mas se fizesse Os projetos que, que já foi passado Para a gente No Vila Nova Palestina Com preservação, com o parque Com, com o funcional A moradia Com o ecológico Para mim, se, se saísse Do papel aquilo, para mim já está Estaria maravilhoso se saísse do papel. Se alguma coisa que tenha para sair do papel sem precisar de tanta luta, porque ali está em 2013 na luta. E, e por mais que tenha projeto, que tenha saído muita coisa, a gente continua na luta com o governo em cima daquela área. Né? Parece que está lutando. Parece faixa de Gaza mesmo, né? 
morava em casa de era serra, morava de favor na casa da minha avó. Mãe que morava de favor na casa da minha avó. Como a Vila Nova Palestina está próxima de onde foi a ocupação é, João Cândido, que é extremo sul da Zona Sul, lá para o lado de Ângela, Capela Calu, a gente era de lá. A João Cândido era da Vila Calu, na divisa de Paulo e Itacirí. A Vila Nova Palestina fica a 20 minutos de onde foi a nossa ocupação, onde a gente morou mesmo na ocupação. E quando organizou aquela, aquela ocupação ali na, na Mirim, a gente foi chamado para estar tá participando, para ajudar na, na organização, na entrada principalmente. E, e eu lembro que hoje, porque foi no, um dia 29, 29 para 30 de novembro, uma sexta-feira, e a gente foi para lá para poder ajudar a organizar, porque a gente distribui bambu, distribui lona, né? precisa organizar as pessoas, uma área muito grande e abandonada sem... É, um destino, né, para para dia para nada, na realidade, um terreno abandonado, um terreno muito grande, muita gente precisando. A gente sabe que é, existe dois lados na periferia, né? O lado que quer lutar e o oportunista, né? O déficit habitacional lá no, na Zona Sul é muito, muito difícil. A gente acabou de ver o, o ocupacento, que foi por causa da Palestina, porque o prefeito está querendo morder o, o terreno, né? um terreno muito bom. Se ele for destinado à moradia, a gente sabe que não vai ser construído um barraco, não vai ser construído uma favela, vai ser construído um condomínio. Eu tenho esperança, sim, de daqui de mais uns dois anos a gente passar ali pela Boimirim e ver um condomínio maravilhoso com as pessoas de luta ali daquele terreno. Porque tem gente ali que entrou, tá ali desde o começo, né? Você é de São Paulo? Da Bahia. Da Bahia, quando você veio pra cá? Acho que tem tempo, hein? Acho que tem uns um... 20 anos por aí ou mais. Você sente que assim, São Paulo é uma cidade que te acolheu, que te recebeu bem, ou sempre se sentiu meio deslocado na cidade? É bem difícil essa, né? <risos> Bom, eu acho que assim, mano, você acolhe ao mesmo tempo, você é, é muito distante as coisas, né? O trabalho da periferia, essas coisas. Mas vamos seguindo a vida. Você sente que São Paulo é a sua cidade? Ah, no momento sim. No momento sim. Eu estou aqui, né? Então. E como é que está a situação da Vila Nova Palestina? Bom, a Palestina é uma ocupação que ela já vem se completando para 10 anos. Né? Tem o um povo o pessoal que mora lá, né? Diretamente os moradores e assim é uma coisa que é um, uma, uma que a gente fala 
é, matar um leão por dia, amarrar o outro por outro dia, porque senão não é uma coisa. Como é que você chegou na ocupação? Como é que foi essa. Você conheceu e resolveu ir para lá? Bom, eu quando fui, é, eu fui três dias depois, fiquei sabendo através de uns vizinhos meus que eles foram no dia. Aí me chamaram, eu falei para eles, cara, eu não vou, não, não, isso não dá certo e tal. Aí, não, vamos lá ver e tal. Eu falei, não, beleza, vamos sim. Aí eu fui lá, conversei com o pessoal da coordenação, eles explicaram como que funciona e o movimento não não cobrar nada de ninguém, que a única coisa que o movimento pede é uma participação na luta e, e se você puder, lógico, um, uma doação, um feijão, que for fazer falta, um arroz, qualquer coisa assim. E aí eu comecei a ver e continuei. Continuei lá, aí comecei a fazer as coisas com o pessoal, organizar a ocupação, puxar água, luz, essas coisas, arrumar barraco, fazer mutirão, e hoje estou aí até agora. O que, que você sonha para ver uma nova Palestina? Ah, que ela construiu o mais rápido possível. Construir a memória do, do pessoal o mais rápido possível. E são 10 anos de luta. O povo que está ali precisa sim da, da moradia, porque 10 anos não são 10 dias. Então, quem está ali é guerreiro mesmo. Se não, não, não estava mais não. Ocupamos. Pelo os legítimos direitos injustamente negados, sonegados. Ocupamos porque plantamos, mas não podemos comer. Fabricamos, mas não podemos comprar. Construímos, mas não podemos morar. Falta saúde, já arrancada no berço. Proletária não tem tempo de amamentar. Esperamos em fila. Quem irá de nossos filhos cuidar? Faltam escolas. Educação em migalhas. Sempre ao fio da navalha, formatado em mais-valia. Trabalhador só pode estudar para aprender as máquinas operar. Conhecer e direcionar ficou para os filhos da burguesia. Falta moradia. Esse nosso maior direito. Jogados nos morros, então, em preto. Eles apostam bilhões no jogo da especulação. Só somos lembrados em dias de preto. Já ocupamos navios, capitanias, cercanias, vilarejos, quilombos, cortiços, cortiços, escombros, bairros e terras. Estamos hoje em vielas, favelas, juntando alegrias na grande nação, Ocupamos e ocuparemos a história esquecida, sem memória, a que não se ensina na escola. Porque edificamos tudo que aí está, porque nunca paramos de lutar e trabalhar. Somos muitos. Somos tantos e tantas de 
exemplos, somos mães, pais, ambulantes, feirantes, pedreiros, pintores, babás, enfermeiras, operadores, auxiliares, vendedores, pastores, pensadores, artistas, violeiros, cantores, jardineiros, confeiteiros, gestores, poetas, motoristas, frentistas, atores, médicos, professores, educadores, domésticas, dançarinas, estudantes, freelancer, escritores, narradores e boias frias. Movimentamos o dia e a noite, muitas vezes embaixo de açoites. Não desistimos, temos fibra e orgulho de saber que somos trabalhadores. Garantindo o preço do que somos os verdadeiros donos do mundo. Thank you for all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation, and I enjoyed learning from your experience. Um, so my name is Munir Nusayba, and uh, I work at Al-Quds University. I teach international law um, at Al-Quds University, but I also um, head a center called Community Action Center that provides legal aid to Palestinians in the old city of Jerusalem. And I feel it's important to um, give a background about my work, especially the Community Action Center in this case, because um, my center is uh, involved on a continuous basis with uh, pro this uh, providing legal aid on areas where the Israeli legal system targets and persecutes the Palestinian population, uh, especially in Jerusalem. Uh, my presentation uh, today will be focusing on uh, the different ethnic cleansing measures that the Israeli um, legal system and political system uh, has been using um, since the Nakba, and we are now around uh, uh, three days after the um, uh, anniversary uh, of the Nakba, uh, the, 50, the 75th anniversary of the Nakba, uh, since the Nakba until today. So next slide, please. Uh, my presentation will be focusing on the different uh, measures that have been taken since 1948 uh, until today. Uh, of course, they will not cover everything, but this cartoon, uh, written by, uh, uh, drawn by a Palestinian cartoon artist, um, uh, says the Arabic words above say, Qanun al ibad which mean the law of deportation. And uh, I find it very um, um, expressive to put it here uh, because I, you, you can see how it, it does express and reflect how the Israeli legal system itself, uh, and it's not one law actually, it's several, several laws, um, focus on the displacement of the Palestinian people on a continuous basis, uh, um, 
uh, because basically when Israel was uh, started and built uh, in 1948 on uh, 78% of the Palestinian land, uh, the Jewish population in Palestine was already a minority, and the, the idea of creating a Jewish state uh, meant for uh, those who created the state uh, that a majority should happen. And since 1948 until the current day, we have been uh, witnessing different uh, displacement measures uh, that uh, the Israeli governments, uh, governments in plural, uh, and the Israeli legal system have been introducing. Next. Uh, slide, please. So I will start by giving this background. In uh, when the Nakba happened uh, in 1947 to 49, it's usually famous as the 14 1948 uh, uh, Nakba. Uh, the uh, population of um, uh, the Palestinian the P Palestinian population in Palestine was uh, uh, basically uh, 70 percent. Uh, were non-Jewish, 30% uh, were, were Jewish, and the idea was to create a Jewish state, and therefore uh, the Zionist organization, which uh, has, which is the um, organization that uh, carried the, um, um, the idea of um, uh, creating this Jewish state and uh, collaborated with uh, the United Kingdom, which occupied Palestine in 1917, to transfer uh, 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 you know, to um, bring Jewish immigration to Palestine. Uh, this organization um, uh, already had planned for transfer of Palestinians uh, at the earliest possible opportunity. And of course, the war of 1948 was that opportunity. And during this war, 80%, uh, 80% of the population of the areas that uh, on which the state of Israel was established, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's a part of Palestine, um, were displaced. 80% of the population, of the Palestinian population, of course, only were displaced. Uh, and this is how uh, Israel managed to make a Jewish majority. Next sli uh, slide, please. Um, and uh, uh, this happened um, as a result of, um, uh, the, you know, the background of this is that um, in 1947, the United Nations recommended uh, the partition of Palestine into, uh, into two states, uh, according to the map on the left, but uh, uh, the map on the right shows the actual um, uh, displacement, the actual uh, conquering that Israel managed uh, uh, to conquer, which was 78% of the total area of Palestine. Next uh, slide, please. Um, as part of this conquering, uh, west, the western part of Jerusalem uh, was also conquered and occupied by, uh, by Israel in 1948. And today, there are almost no, there is no Palestinian population in the western part of Jerusalem. Israel demolished almost all of the villages that the Palestinian villages uh, in the western part of Jerusalem and that a total of 500, uh, more than 500 villages in all of Palestine in the war of 1948, total demolition. But in West Jerusalem, the fate of the Palestinian villages that were in the western area of, of, of Jerusalem were uh, either full demolition where you can find uh, that these now these locations and these beautiful villages that are sitting on water springs have become you know maybe parks like the picture on the left uh, or a, or a partial demolition like lifta the one, the picture on the uh, right top of this uh, slide uh, or they kept the houses as they are in many in many instances actually uh, but they exchanged the population uh, that lives there, from the Palestinian population to uh, uh, Jewish population, like the one in the bottom uh, right of this picture. So uh, whether the villages were destroyed or not, the Palestinian uh, um, owners um, uh, of the houses were certainly displaced, but this was also the city of this, uh, the, the, the fate of the city itself, of the western part of the city itself. Uh, Today, you will not find Palestinians in West Jerusalem. You can walk around 
uh, 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 the streets and the markets and you will find beautiful buildings. Uh, some of them have Arabic writing on them. Um, and uh, actually some of them, the Palestinian owners of these houses or their uh, their children and the, uh, and grandchildren, uh, they, they, they go, they look at their house, uh, they take a picture of it. Sometimes they knock at the door, but uh, they are unable to take back the house because the Israeli legal system prevents that. Israel created a law called absentee property law, um, um, according to which, um, uh, you know, which actually gives the um, a special governmental body called the absentee property custodian, the authority to uh, administer and in some cases transfer the ownership of, of these houses. And uh, the Israeli legal system and co including the courts have prevented Palestinians over the past decades from claiming their houses back in the western part of Jerusalem. Uh, next slide, please. In 1967, Israel occupied the uh, eastern part of Jerusalem together with the rest of, uh, rest of the West Bank and Gaza. You can see uh, the map on the left, uh, which shows that Israel got control of over uh, all of the uh, uh, territory of Palestine, uh, including the West Bank uh, and, and, and Gaza. And as soon as they... Uh, uh, conducted this uh, occupation, uh, Israel uh, demolished 135 houses uh, in the Moroccan quarter uh, of uh, the old city. It's These are ancient houses. Uh, they totally demolished them in order to uh, expand the plaza uh, of uh, the Wailing Wall, basically, uh, which is the western wall of Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, so they demolished all of these houses, ancient old houses uh, from the Moroccan quarters and displaced the uh, uh, population. And also they displaced uh, residents from the uh, 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 Jewish quarter, the Palestinian residents who lived in the Jewish quarter. Next slide, please. Um, and at the same time, what Israel did is uh, in, in 1967 is that it annexed uh, the eastern part of Jerusalem. This annexation is uh, uh, meant, effectively, that Israel was implementing its domestic legal system in the occupied Palestinian uh, uh, territory, and not all of it, in, in the area that it decided to annex, which is the eastern part of Jerusalem. This includes all of the old city of Jerusalem, as well as a number of other uh, neighborhoods and villages that were originally outside Jerusalem that became part of the newly annexed area. But the most important thing for us today um, uh, is that this annexation uh, meant that Israel decided to um, annex, uh, to uh, implement its domestic legal system uh, in the eastern part of uh, Jerusalem. Next slide, please. This also meant that uh, Israel decided to uh, uh, so Israel annexed the territory, but it did not really annex uh, the people. Uh, what it actually did is that there were Palestinians who were living in the eastern side of Jerusalem. They took a census, and then they decided to give a status of permanent residence to all the Palestinians who lived in this area. This permanent uh, residency status uh, meant that the Palestinians who continued to live in this area were not citizens of Israel, do not get the rights of citizens, uh, but were only residents whose actual presence in the city uh, uh, would allow them to continue living uh, in it. Basically, they introduced a residency revocation policy. This residency revocation policy uh, um, was based on a number of laws that uh, Israel introduced. At the beginning, uh, the um, Israel used to revoke residencies based on either that if the Palestinian from Jerusalem leaves the area for seven years or more, or if the Palestinian from Jerusalem uh, gets a permanent residency abroad or gets a citizenship abroad. This, these were the first conditions 
according to which the Israeli legal system facilitated the revocation of residency. This continued to be the case until 1994, when Palestinians in Jerusalem, uh, when, when the Israeli, when the peace process started actually, uh, and the Palestinian Authority was established in part of the West Bank, and uh, when the negotiations for the final status of uh, uh, of Palestine and uh, Jerusalem were ha- were taking place, uh, of course they ended, they failed, they never worked, but they were taking place. So during that period, Israel started to um, uh, speed up its uh, colonial policies, including the residency revocation policy. So uh, uh, Israel invented a new method for residency revocation known as center of life. And according to this method, if Palestinians uh, from Jerusalem do not live within the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem uh, or or in another area where Israel uh, claims its sovereignty, but lives, let's say, in the West Bank or in Gaza Strip, then or abroad, for that matter, um, then they consider that these people uh, have um, moved their center of life to outside uh, Israel, the area that they consider under their sovereign territory. And uh, therefore, they, uh, uh, they would... Uh, you know they would lose they would they will have their residency revoked as a result of this after this policy thousands of palestinians uh, had their residencies revoked by the israeli ministry of interior uh, either because they live in the west bank or they live in gaza or they live abroad and uh, also as a result of uh, uh, um, of of of, of uh, uh, so uh, many of them tried to go back to the Ministry of Interior, tried to uh, reclaim their residency. Many of them failed, but uh, uh, um, very recently uh, there has been an ability to cl- reclaim or restart your residency status, uh, according to Israeli to a certain Supreme Court uh, decision by the uh, Israeli Ministry of uh, uh, so by, by the Israeli Supreme Court. But we have been as as a center. Uh, trying uh, as much as possible to work on this issue to help Palestinians uh, uh, to restart their residency status. Some uh, situations succeed, but many others fail. They will find always that the Ministry of Interior uh, uh, tries as much as possible to uh, uh, find any justification in order to keep these residences revoked. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, another problem related to uh, uh, to this uh, policy is uh, um, is family unification. Israel has greatly restricted family unification between Palestinians in Jerusalem and Palestinians in uh, the West Bank. When Israel occupied uh, the occupied Palestinian territory in 1967, uh, it actually divided uh, uh, the area. Uh, in different ways. Uh, Jerusalem was annexed. Uh, However, uh, the rest of the West Bank and Gaza were not annexed, and therefore uh, the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza were given different types of uh, uh, residency permits. Um, But in all cases, uh, according to the Israeli legal system, if a Palestinian from Jerusalem uh, marries a Palestinian from the West Bank or Gaza, they need to apply for family unification in order to live together under the same roof uh, in Jerusalem. However, in 2003, the Israeli parliament enacted a law that prevents a Palestinian from the West Bank or Gaza from uh, getting uh, any permanent residency status. Uh, in Jerusalem or any other area where that Israel uh, uh, assumes its sovereignty on. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, the Palestinians, if successful, they will at, at best get a temporary permit to stay in, in Jerusalem. And uh, this uh, uh, temporary permit is very problematic, in fact. If uh, the Palestinian spouse who comes from the West Bank or Gaza uh, 
uh, or actually for other countries uh, to that matter, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Iran, and Iraq, they also added them to the list uh, in addition to the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, if these, uh, so first I would say, if you marry someone from Gaza, you cannot apply for family unification at all. There is no temporary permit. There is nothing. You either live in Gaza and then lose your own residency revocation, uh, residency status because of the revocation because you have moved to uh, uh, to Gaza, or uh, you go abroad and you also lose your uh, uh, residency status. So if you marry or you live separately, and there are families, Palestinian families, who have uh, who has you know who have uh, their family members living separately. Uh, but also, if you're living separately in Gaza, Gaza is under siege. You cannot freely go there. You need a permit to enter it. You need a permit to exit from it. Uh, and uh, Israel does not give this permit frequently. So uh, it is really difficult and complicated to get a permit. Uh, uh, and, and these families don't meet. Uh, I've seen um, family members uh, um, uh, who... Uh, only would meet in, in, in public holidays. Like there is a family that I know, uh, the husband and wife only met over the past few, uh, uh, you know, over the past uh, decade or more, only met uh, in, um, uh, in, in in the holidays, in Easter and Christmas. Uh, it's, it's actually a Christian family, so they celebrate Easter and Christmas. So they only met in some Easter's and some Christmases uh, if if they if the father who was from Gaza managed to get a permit to uh, to enter uh, uh, Jerusalem and visit his the rest of his family wife and children who were in Jerusalem, so it's actually it breaks out the family in 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 in, in a great uh, difficult way unfortunately. Uh, so this is the situation if the person is from Gaza, but if the if if the spouse is from the West Bank, you can apply for a permit for them to stay. This permit is temporary. It is dependent. Uh, it needs to be renewed every year, and uh, the person who comes from the West Bank is totally dependent on the spouse who is from Jerusalem to continue applying the year after and the year after and the year after. And then, if the spouse uh, from Jerusalem uh, passes away, dies, then uh, there is nothing you can do. Uh, nobody to actually apply for this family unification process anymore. So the permit will not be renewed. Also. If they get a divorce, even if they have children, by the way, um, if they get a divorce, it's the same situation. Uh, the spouse who is from the West Bank will uh, um, have to go back to their uh, to, to the West Bank, uh, even if they have no house in the West Bank, if they have not no place to stay. They or in many cases they will be living illegally in Jerusalem, uh, which means without a permit. Um, so this is the complication of, of the marriage issue. But I should add to this that Israel also greatly restricts residency revocation of, uh, sorry, uh, child registration of Palestinian children um, in Jerusalem specifically, uh, especially if a child is born abroad or if one of the uh, uh, spouses uh, is not a resident of Jerusalem. In such cases, the Israeli uh, legal system uh, prevents the uh, uh, child, the family, to, to register their child. And then the uh, family will have to go through a very complicated bureaucratic process in order to register the child. In some cases, they succeed. And this is something that my center works in. Uh, so in some cases, we succeed. Uh, we managed to prove that uh, this family is living in Jerusalem and the center of life is in Jerusalem and therefore managed to register the child. But in some other cases, we fail. Uh, the Israeli Ministry of Interior would argue that this family is not living actually in Jerusalem and therefore they will not register this child uh, or that they lived for a certain period in the West Bank and therefore they need a much more complicated process in order to register the child. Um, and therefore... Uh, we have thousands of children who are not registered. Uh, either way, they have an application pending in the Ministry of Interior uh, or rejected applications for that matter, uh, or that uh, they uh, don't have an application in the first place. Many uh, Palestinian children who are born abroad uh, have never even started the process of child registration. Uh, 
um, and therefore, uh, it, you know, it becomes much more complicated and difficult for them. Uh, uh, if, if they grow up and, you know, um, become older, uh, 14 years old if they lived in the West Bank or 18 years old if they lived in other places, places around the world, in that case, they would um, se- um, lose their right to, um, re- re- to be registered in the population registry. Uh, and there are pe- children who grew up to adulthood uh, who have no legal status at all. There are several people in Jerusalem, living in Jerusalem, but have no legal status. The Israeli Ministry of Interior denied their uh, child registration um, uh, application and therefore uh, uh, denied them any uh, status. So they live and they have no ID card. They have no uh, passport. They cannot travel. They cannot open a bank account. They cannot uh, uh, cash checks even if they work. So they live a very, very complicated life. Um, and uh, uh, and according to the uh, current uh, Israeli uh, uh, system that applies on them, uh, they are unable to uh, resolve this issue and get a proper uh, uh, registration. Uh, this is very sad. We see a lot of uh, humanitarian cases, I would say, uh, of Palestinians who have no registration and this is blocking their lives. Uh, including, for example, marriage options, you know, just the the simple uh, thing of uh, uh, being able to marry normally, to work normally, to live normally. Um, It's very difficult for these people. Next slide, please. I talked about residency revocation uh, earlier in the slide before, and uh, here I need to tell you about the more recent policy Uh, for residency revocation. I mentioned before that Israel used several criteria, uh, center of life, um, uh, being abroad for seven years, uh, getting a residency abroad and citizenship abroad as justifications for um, residency revocation. But what is important here also to, um, uh, to mention is that in 2006, a Palestinian election took place and there were a number of uh, Palestinians who were elected for the Palestinian Legislative Council uh, representing uh, Jerusalem. When this happened, the Israeli Minister of Interior decided to revoke the residencies of four Palestinians uh, uh, who won in the elections, saying that they have breached their allegiance to the state of Israel by uh, being uh, elected in a foreign uh, parliament and also by uh, uh, belonging to, uh, uh, to, to a group uh, and th- that Israel saw as a terrorist group. Uh, so they revoked their residency status and uh, left them uh, without, without status at all. Uh, these people, uh, uh, the parliamentarians and, uh, and, and the minister also, they went to uh, the Israeli Supreme Court and they filed a case saying that the Basically, uh, the main argument was that Israeli law at the time did not allow for residency revocation based on breach of allegiance to the state of Israel. Uh, And uh, the court said uh, uh, after 11 years of examining this case that indeed that was the situation. However, uh, 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 and and that the revocation was uh, illegal at the time. However, it gave the Israeli government uh, the opportunity to go and legislate, uh, that was like the guidance of the court, to go to the Knesset, to the parliament, and legislate a law that allows this revocation. And it kept the revocation of these residences as well as some other residency statuses that had been revoked. It kept them uh, uh, pending. Uh, it kept the revocation, actually. It did not cancel uh, or uh, annul uh, this uh, revocation of residency. Um, and indeed, in a very short period of time, in six months, the Israeli government managed to uh, uh, get the Israeli parliament to uh, legislate uh, um, a law that allows residency revocation based on breach of allegiance. And uh, actually, at the end of uh, uh, 
2022, there was an uh, important case of a Palestinian human rights defender who worked in a Palestinian human rights organization called Adamir, who had his residency revoked based on breach of allegiance. And because he had a French citizenship, um, Israel managed to put him on a plane forcibly after uh, after he exhausted all the ways that he could in order to get any court order uh, for him not to be deported. Eventually, the Israeli courts allowed his deportation and Israel forced him on a plane and sent him to, to France uh, because he has a French citizenship. So now, according to Israel, this man has no other, no relationship to Jerusalem, no legal relationship to Jerusalem, and his residency uh, has been revoked. His name is Salah Hamouri. Of course, you can uh, expand on his case if you if you Google him and you'll find a lot of information about, about his case. Um, next uh, slide, please. Um, another thing, another measure that Israel uh, has taken um, is that it has built a wall uh, in the area uh, in Jerusalem between uh, the city and the neighborhoods uh, surrounding it. This specific segment that you can see uh, this picture was taken while the wall was being built uh, between uh, in, in a place that separates between where I live and where I work, my university. So now my university main campus uh, uh, is on the on one side of the wall, and my house is on another side of the wall. And of course, this wall has separated many families. But um, what is also important to mention is that. There are 120,000 Palestinians from Jerusalem living uh, outside this wall in an area that Israel still considers part of the Jerusalem uh, municipal territory. And uh, 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 these people are, of course, finding difficulty accessing a lot of rights and a lot of services in Jerusalem as a result of this wall. However, in addition to this, and that's very important, there are campaigns within the Israeli political arena uh, to consider that these areas that are on the other side of the wall, that they are outside Jerusalem. And uh, uh, and that if that happens, uh, many Palestinians, these this number of Palestinians, this estimation, the 120,000 residents would, uh, would probably lose their residency status. This is something that we are very much worried about um especially that the areas that are on the other side of, of the wall um they have gathered many people uh, living there um because uh, uh, especially in families where there is one spouse from Jerusalem and the other spouse was from the West Bank uh, they find it comfortable uh, to live in an area uh, where the spouse from the West Bank does not need a permit to live right uh, because it's on the other side of the wall, uh, so they don't need a permit, so they live there uh, easily, uh, and uh, and then they apply for family unification or child registration while while they are uh, living in a place where they do not need a permit initially to apply. Uh, next slide, please. Another policy uh, that is um, also very important is the policy of zoning and planning in Jerusalem. After the occupation of the eastern side of Jerusalem, uh, Israel uh, zoned uh, the city in a way that encourages uh, Israeli Jewish-only settlements to be built in the city. 35% uh, of uh, the total area uh, was expropriated uh, for, is the, for building Israeli settlements. You know, whole mountains and regions were uh, um, ex expropriated for this um, for this method, uh, for this purpose, and uh, indeed the Israeli uh, uh, governments uh, uh, over the past decades have built several Israeli settlements. Uh, another 22% uh, 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 of the land were designated as green areas, which means that these areas are uh, uh, Palestinians are, you know, nobody is allowed to build on these areas because uh, it would be illegal to, to do that. Uh, because there are green areas according to the uh, zoning, and 30% uh, of the land is was not planned uh, at all, which means also it is illegal to build on it. 
so Palest Palestinian uh, only 13 percent of the land was available for uh, uh, building um, and it was already built so basically what the Israeli zoning policy was to limit the areas on which Palestinians could build uh, and maximize the areas on which um, the Jewish population builds or the government builds for the Jewish population uh, and uh, this meant that Palestinians, uh, many Palestinians actually built on their own lands, built new houses on their own lands, but these houses were seen as illegal. Next slide, slide please. They were seen as illegal. Uh, it was very difficult for, it's, it's very difficult for Palestinians to uh, uh, get um, a permit to uh, live in Jerusalem. Uh, it's very expensive, even if your land is uh, designated as a, uh, an area for uh, residential construction. It's very expensive uh, to get a, a permit. Um, and of course, the Palestinian uh, population of Jerusalem uh, uh, lives under the poverty line. 75% uh, of them live under the poverty line. Uh, so Palestinians were not going to find the funds to, uh, uh, you know, to, to to apply for a permit even if they can, and in many cases they cannot because the area is not zoned uh, for that purpose. This means that there are around sixty thousand people estimated to be at the risk of having their homes demolished in Jerusalem, uh, based on this uh, justification that they have uh, built without a permit. Um, we, we have been representing Palestinians who did that, and uh, the maximum usually we can get is, a post, is that the court allows to postpone the demolition, uh, but uh, the lives of Palestinians who have had their homes demolished, demolished or, or at risk of demolition also becomes very difficult. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to that, there is a, a policy of collective punishment that Israel uses, and again, like everything else, uh, what the Israeli government does in these cases is another uh, method of displacement. This woman, uh, uh, her name is Sara Dwayat from uh, Sur Bahir. She, uh, Sur Bahir is a neighborhood in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, her son was accused of throwing a stone at a moving vehicle, which uh, led to the death of the driver. As soon as he was accused of this uh, crime, even before he was convicted, uh, his mother uh, who and sister who lived in their house uh, were told that they were uh, that they will have to leave this house. And indeed, the Israeli government uh, came and sealed the house. You can see the door in the picture welded and with an iron bar also uh, closing it. And the same with all the windows and any other door in in in, in the house, because uh, as as a collective punishment, they actually went to her and told her that this is a collective punishment, uh, or that that this is a punishment so that other people will learn uh, and not uh, throw stones or do other uh, uh, similar actions. Uh, so until today, this lady is unable to live in a, in her house, and she's of course she's poor. She's unable to uh, uh, finding a lot of difficulties paying rent or finding a different place, uh, but she was forcibly displaced out of their, her, her house until the current day. Every year she gets uh, a property tax bill uh, from the uh, Israeli uh, Jerusalem municipality um, for her to pay that, uh, uh, that bill. And uh, we always uh, uh, give her the service uh, the legal service of uh, arguing to the municipality that she is unable to live in her house because of uh, the Israeli government policy that was approved by the Israeli uh, uh, court system. And therefore, it's not fair for her to pay this tax uh, if she's unable to use the house and if the house is actually sealed by the Israeli government. So um, this is one way of collective punishment. And next slide. The other one is uh, demolition. This is also a house that was demolished for this woman and her children, uh, also based on uh, 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 an attack that her husband uh, 
conducted a shooting attack and therefore they punished her and her children despite the fact that uh, her uh, uh, husband was killed on that uh, incident so um, you know what 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 further punishment can you punish a person uh, more than killing that person but this is the actual thing that happened they uh, uh, they shot the man dead on the incident and then they started um uh, a whole collective punishment policy on his family this is very common and the israeli supreme court has uh, frequently uh, authorized these collective punishment measures like home demolition and horse sealing uh, and home sealing also uh, welding and sealing the homes uh, today the israeli government is expanding uh, the methods of collective punishment and all of them are also uh, aiming at uh, more residency uh, revocations. We have represented a case where a Palestinian has had his uh, um, uh, family unification permit denied, uh, even after living in Jerusalem for several years, because the half-uncle of his wife was accused of uh, uh, ramming soldiers with his truck. Right? This is a case that we are representing. Uh, in the Israeli court system. Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that the methods of collective punishment, punishment are increasing and this these methods of collective punishment uh, focus on deportation, displacement, uh, transfer, moving people out of their homes, also going with the same policy that has started since 1948. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here we find also another uh, group of uh, women who are uh, suffering from collective punishment. Uh, it's a group of women who protest against uh, Israeli settlers and soldiers and police members coming to the Holy Al-Aqsa Mosque in, in, in Jerusalem. Um, and uh, the Israeli uh, authorities frequently um, uh, start by revoking their membership in the social welfare system, which we pay taxes for, and the medical insurance system, which we all pay taxes for as well, and they themselves pay taxes for all of their lives, uh, only uh, because these women uh, were protesting peacefully against the Israeli police and army and settlers and extremists entering Al-Aqsa Mosque. Next slide, please. So I... You know, my presentation certainly, uh, and the time that I have, uh, certainly uh, cannot cover all of the measures of uh, uh, collective punishment, but, uh, sorry, of, of displacement. But I should draw your attention that we have uh, this infographic, which I can also send uh, if I haven't, I think I haven't already sent it. Um, and this infographic uh, shows and explains a number of policies like child registration and family unification and uh, uh, residency revocation and home demolition, and all of that. But at the same time, it also shows how Israel treats the, um, uh, 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 the Jewish population uh, at the same time. So while the Palestinians are suffering from all of this, the, the Israeli Jewish population uh, does not face these types of uh, measures, but at the same time, they face uh, an encouragement. For example, uh, Israel gives the right to any Jew from anywhere around the world to immigrate uh, uh, to Israel. And when once they immigrate, they can live in any place they like. They can live in Jerusalem. They can live in uh, uh, settlements in Jerusalem, settlements in the West Bank, settlements in, you know, in any place or uh, uh, freely. But not only this. Um, and then they get citizenship and all of that. But not only this. Also, if the, uh, the according to Israeli law, they can also invite. Uh, uh, the, the, there is a right to uh, return according to the Israeli law. They call it return, right to immigration uh, to Israel, that is given to the uh, parents of the Jew as as it is defined by the Israeli law. The grandparents of the Jew, the children of the Jew, the grandchildren of the Jew. Uh, and siblings and spouses and all of that. Um, so this is a right for Jews only. And in addition to that, if a Jewish 
couple are present uh, according to, you know, using a tourist visa to, uh, one second, key? No, you don't need the key. No need for a key? Just close the door. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Sorry, thank you. Um, so if uh, if that person, um, if, if this, this couple is present in Jerusalem based on a, um, uh, on a tourist visa, they are there on a tourist visa, and they have a child while on a tourist visa, huh? and I'm saying visa because, you know, we live in Jerusalem according to a visa, but visa of permanent resident. But even if they are there in Jerusalem on a tourist visa, in such a case, um, the uh, the child that is born in Israel, including in occupied Jerusalem, uh, will be automatically uh, an Israeli citizen. So this whole issue that I talked about with child registration restrictions that the Palestinians have to suffer from but despite the fact that they are permanent residents, uh, according to the way they are defined in the Israeli legal system, uh, the Israeli Jewish population, uh, uh, not no, the international Jewish population, even tourists do not face, they will have their children registered as residents automatically. Uh, and this is, um, you know, uh, this will show also partly how or the rightfulness of the description of the Israeli regime that is uh, ruling over Palestine as an apartheid regime and a, com a commitment that, that the Israeli government is committing the uh, crime of apartheid. Uh, this different uh, treatment uh, of Palestinians and Jews uh, in the Israeli legal system uh, is colonial. It is working on changing the demography. Uh, this is the you know this is the main goal of it, and uh, uh, and it does amount to apartheid, as clarified by different human rights organizations, including um, uh, Al Haq, Beit Salem, an Israeli human rights organization, Yesh Deen, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, etc. And there are more and more organizations, uh, uh, you know, clarifying this position today. Uh, next slide, please. So the Israeli policies, you know, these two pictures are pictures of, uh, on the left, there is uh, someone who was running for elections and his, uh, um, the slogans of his uh, election campaign uh, is transfer that if you read this the word here in Hebrew, it's it's a party that was called Muladet. Now it doesn't exist, but there are more extreme right wing groups now in the Knesset also. But his plan and his what he went to elections with that was transfer. You know, this is this is what he's running to the Israeli Knesset elections with because it seems that this uh, uh, shows as an you know attractive. Uh, symbol and uh, plan uh, for many people you can see also how the expulsion in the right in the picture on the right certainly something you will uh, you will find uh, uh, in slogans of right-wing uh, people who have uh, been able to um, you know to reach the government and the current government is full of these uh, uh, right-wing uh, fundamentalists uh, who want to continue transferring us and to escalate it. Next slide, please. But at the end of the day, the Palestinian population believes uh, in uh, uh, continuing to live on our land, uh, resisting. Uh, uh, we believe that we are rooted, as you can see in the uh, uh, cartoon on the right, uh, that we are rooted. We try, we always try our best and do all of our efforts in order not to be displaced, to stay in our lands. Uh, and this is in itself, sumud, uh, resilience. This in itself, we find it as the best resistance we can do to stay in our lands, to stay in our houses. But also, uh, as the picture on the left uh, shows, this is a Palestinian refugee carrying the keys to his house that he was displaced from. 
So Palestinian refugees and displaced persons still work on the right of return. That's their demand and they want to return. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I am happy to, um, to go to the Q&A session. So waiting for Nancy. Uh, well, thank uh, both of you, Nancy and Munir, for your uh, presentations. Of course, the very different situations, and we'll uh, now have the opportunity for Clara to uh, inform you and come to each of you the questions from the students. Thank you, Clara. Thank you very much. É, muito obrigada a todos, todas e todos que estão presentes aqui hoje, nessa décima, nesse décimo primeiro encontro que estamos fazendo né, desse curso. É, first, I need to thank everyone who is here today. Today is our 11th class, and I believe that all the themes have been very rich, and the participation of all those present in the classes is something very positive for our meeting. Uh, thank you very much, Nancy and Professor Munir for uh, accept, accepting to be with us today, talking about such an important subject uh, that involves the process of gentrification of cities through the uh, analysis of two different territorial contexts, but which are very connected. Um, I kept thinking about the connections that the prospect of ethnic cleansing is also part of a process of social stratification in apartheid. And see, it seems important to me uh, to point out that this week marks the 70th uh, anniversary of the Nakba, a catastrophe that today makes uh, technically uh, 25 percent of the world refugee population to be made up of Palestinians. So it's very opportune that today we are discussing the parallels between the reality of homelessness and the exile of thousands of people as a political project. And now uh, I will start the moment to ask some questions. Um, I will try to speak slowly, so when, if you need me to repeat, please let me know. Um, uh, some questions are more directed to Nancy or others to Professor Munir, but two of you can answer if you wish. Okay. And now uh, the first question is directed to Nancy. Nancy, é, é, essa pergunta eu vou falar em português e depois eu, eu traduzo, é, fala um pouco sobre outras ocupações que, que existem né, em, em São Paulo, no Brasil, e que podem ter uma relação né, com a Brasil-Palestina, é, para além da, da, da que você, das que você mencionou. Né? É, Traduzindo agora, Nancy, we had a question about Leila Haled occupation. Uh, do you know if this name chosen because of its proximity to the Palestinian left wing, are there other occupations that relate situations in Brazil to Palestine? Ok, é, eu, eu, eu vou responder em português primeiro, vou pedir para o, já que você fez em português, para as pessoas ouvirem também, e pedir para o Lourenço me ajudar aqui depois. É, a, essa, essa escolha desse nome tem a ver com uma proximidade da luta entre os palestinos e as pessoas que são excluídas aqui, é, é, excluídas aqui no Brasil, em São Paulo, em todo o Brasil. Então, a, é um, aqui a, a exclusão é mais econômica e social, é, diferente um pouco da questão da Palestina, e a escolha do nome é, teve essa, 
teve esse momento histórico político no Brasil do, uma, do maior suporte do governo, uma maior é, proximidade em relação à Palestina e, e também com a, o dia de entrada na, no terreno da ocupação foi o dia da solidariedade ao povo palestino. Outras, as outras ocupações no, do MTST no, em São Paulo e no Brasil, elas têm todas essa característica de é, juntar pessoas excluídas é, da moradia e dos direitos sociais para poder lutar por um, um direito básico, um direito humano básico, que é negado. Então, a proximidade ela está nessa... É, nessa forma de luta, né, de resistir e de buscar os seus direitos. Então, o povo palestino é brutalmente excluído por Israel e, e é, sem nem expressar a violência que esse povo vive. E, e aqui a gente tem essa, essa luta irmã. Né? Vou pedir para o Lourenço agora traduzir para facilitar. Uh, hi. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm also from MTST. Uh, Nancy has told us that the name choosing, uh, it was due to the historical moment of diplomatic international relations of Brazil and in solidarity of Palestine. Uh, we all in the, in the left movement are very sensible to the Palestinian question since, <laughs> since ever. And so it is a very important reference for a worldwide struggle. Uh, the, the life in our occupations uh, seems in many ways similar to the, to the ways of living of those excluded in the Palestinian and in other situations around the world. Uh, and we try to gather together people who are excluded from basic human rights. Uh, so... Uh, the situation of the Palestinian people, we understand uh, that it's a very brutal situation of exclusion. In Brazil, it's it's more of a social and an economic, it's a different situation, but it's also a, a more subtle uh, way of ethnic cleansing, one way or another, an exclusion from our cities, from the center of the cities and always towards the periphery. So that's it. Uh, the, the name of the occupation was due to the, the coincidence of the day of the Palestinian struggle also, but uh, it remains a, an important reference for us. That's it. Here we uh, cleansing. Um, uh, we have the cameras in, poli uh, in the PA. Uh, in the military police. Military police reduce the killing of uh, teenagers in Sao Paulo. Yes, it's an informal uh, situation, but the killing of black pe people, black young people in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, by the military police is a very strong issue. And since they have uh, started having these this cameras on their, on their Uniform. wear, uniforms, uh, the killings have dropped dramatically. So it's a many a militants, question. many people from MTST had, had children killed by the police here. Thank you. Obrigada pela resposta. It's very important what you said about the issue. So let's do the, the second question. Um, is there any inspiration from international movements such as the MTST for the struggle for housing in Palestine? Are there international cooperation between housing organizations? I think both can answer. É, o movimento surgiu é, dessa ligação com o, é, o MST, é, as estratégias foram separadas por conta do tipo de luta que o, MT, o MST e o MTST fazem. É, existem, é, depois da criação do MTST, 
é, existem é, intercâmbios é, de conhecimento, de reconhecimento com movimentos do, da África do Sul. É, a gente tem também agora o movimento do Sem Direito, que, é, que são é, trabalhadores informais, que surgiu a partir do MTST, e ele, a gente tem intercâmbios também em outros países, como Colômbia e Argentina. É, então, são, são trocas de experiências que vêm acontecendo. Uh, o movimento atua de uma forma independente, mas procura trocar experiências com outros movimentos de moradia do, do mundo e movimentos de trabalhadores uh, excluídos, trabalhadores informais e pessoas que estão é, nessa, é, nessa exclusão social de moradia. So, uh, we from the, the movement, the MTST, uh, since we have departed from the landless uh, workers' movement, we, we, we are still in very uh, cool relations, interesting relations with them and we are with other movements all around the world. I think uh, we see it as very important to exchange uh, knowledge of methods and of uh, working methods Uh, all around the world uh, in Latin America, but also with the movements in Palestine and in other, uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, the movement has a, a special part of international relations that, that does this. Thank you very much, Professor Muni. If you want to complement with talking about some uh, cooperation Uh, with organization, uh, your mic is on mute. Yes, sorry. No. What's, what what do you want me to to comment on, please? No, sorry. only if you want to to. Excuse me, Clara. Excuse me. She was asking if you want to comment on any type of cooperation between your uh, human rights clinic, your organizations, Al Hat and other organizations for human rights and to protect uh, homing and housing, etc., cetera, in, in the world about cooperations? Ah, uh, yes, there is a lot of cooperation uh, uh, with, with the world, not necessarily, uh, I am not aware of specific cooperation, for example, in Brazil. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to let today to learn about uh, the, uh, you know the work that uh, the great work that you are doing uh, in, in Brazil. Um, but yes, there is a lot of cooperation, and this cooperation, uh, for example, me as an academic, uh, I do have academic cooperation with different uh, professors and universities, and many other academics have the same. Whether it is based on research or based on advocacy, uh, um, uh, you know, this is all. Um, um, uh, uh, happening also with the help of many other organizations and uh, uh, in the world. Uh, but also I know that the Palestinian civil society is very active. Uh, it always has uh, important links with partners from uh, uh, different places uh, uh, around the world. Um, and uh, I believe it's very, this is very important, um, in fact. Um, the, uh, Uh, the support that justice can get from uh, international uh, uh, civil society uh, is, uh, is 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 very important. It gets the word uh, through. Uh, it um, uh, gets us to reach our goals and to uh, advance the justice cause um, uh, in, 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 in a much faster way. So yes, certainly. Thank you, Professor. And now we have a question by Luiz Henrique Junqueira. And he asks, how does the UN Human Rights Council and UNESCO, among other agencies, deal with family removal and arouse demolition in Jerusalem, such as the case of the Maghreb neighborhood? 
Yes, uh, I'm actually today talking from New York. I am uh, in New York for the United Nations, uh, um, you know, for some advocacy and work in uh, related to the United Nations uh, headquarters in New York. But I also am involved with uh, with the Human Rights Council. And uh, yes, the Human Rights Council, uh, the General Assembly, uh, uh, even the Security Council of the United Nations have frequently, very frequently condemned the home demolitions, the settlements, and uh, um, uh, the displacement of Palestinians. This is happening every year, by the way. Every year, there is a condemnation. But not only that, we have uh, special rapporteurs uh, uh, who have been examining this uh, for the past few decades and uh, uh, documenting it well. And we have... um, uh, a special committee from the UN that is investigating and documenting and reporting. So the information is out there. Everybody knows it. It's being condemned quite frequently by the international community. We have mechanisms following it up, but then we always face the problem of actual accountability. You know, okay, we we all know now the facts. What happens next? And this is where we are stuck, actually. Once we get to demanding measures for accountability, prosecution for uh, people who commit war crimes and crimes against humanity, or uh, measures taken against the state of Israel until it abides by international law and stops this, uh, 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 you know, these crimes. Because, you know, forced displacement in occupied territory is a crime. Building settlement in occupied territory is a crime, is a crime in international law. So, uh, there are really serious violations of international law and they are well documented and well reported and uh, and well condemned but then there are no measures and this is our this is where we are stuck we want to see measures concrete measures uh, and if concrete measures start to actually take place i think we will go to a totally different uh, uh, place and israel will 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 understand that it cannot continue doing this forever and policy will change. But Israel has been uh, shielded by uh, the international community that is unwilling to uh, intervene in any way. Thank you, Professor. And let me see other questions. Uh, Natalia Geraldine Sabat asks, is there any kind of public policies that ends the protection of historic buildings in Palestine? Yes, there are. Uh, But when Israel demolished the Moroccan quarter, and you saw the pictures, these ancient houses, they did it immediately while the war is still happening, you know, like immediately after, basically. So they took advantage of the war in order to demolish the whole neighborhood. Now, uh, it will be much more difficult to demolish houses uh, uh, that old because the Israeli law itself actually prohibits demolishing old houses. But what they do now is they try to, in many cases, to um, force the Palestinian population, uh, residents of the houses out and exchange them with uh, with Jewish uh, residents. And this is a situation that we keep seeing around us in the old city of Jerusalem, but also in the newer neighborhoods. You know, when I say the old city of Jerusalem, I'm talking about a a city that is thousands of years old. uh, uh, And the newer one is maybe, you know, the the, the houses are also old, like, uh, you know, it could be 200 years, 150 years. This is like, and and more recent, of course, but, uh, you know, Jerusalem is an ancient city. Uh, so, yes, uh, there are laws. Uh, it will be much more difficult today to, be, to to demolish. But they took advantage of the war because they wanted to expand the plaza uh, of, of, of the Wailing Wall so that there is much bigger uh, space for uh, Jewish prayer in that, in that area. Thank you, Professor. And let me see if we have other questions. 
and Rafael for our team. Uh, 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 how is the case for family reunification for Palestinians with blue IDs living in Area C in the West Bank, such as Kalandia and other space? Yes. Uh, so usually it is the Palestinian with a blue ID, that is a Palestinian who has the Israeli residency status, uh, who invites their spouse for, uh, who has a green ID card, uh, and that is a Palestinian who is from the West Bank, has a West Bank residency status, uh, to live together in, uh, uh, in an Israeli area. The other way around is not, uh, doesn't happen. There is no Palestinian from Jerusalem who will go to live in Area C or in uh, uh, areas that are outside the municipal area, uh, territory of Jerusalem or the areas where Israel assume, assumes its sovereign territory. Because if you go basically to the West Bank in very simple terms, Israel will claim that you're, you have moved your center of life to outside Israel and therefore you will lose your residency status. So even, you know, and, and this also shows you the apartheid here. There are many Jews living in the West Bank, in Area C, in settlements that were built for them, for built for the Jewish uh, population, Jewish Israeli population. They are living there, uh, enjoying all the rights that they would enjoy if if they lived in areas under Israeli sovereignty. Uh, uh, they uh, they participate in the social welfare. They pay the taxes. They receive the benefits. They uh, have medical insurance. They have all the benefits of a resident in Israel. So they're not considered for that matter living abroad. But if I go and live in the West Bank, not only will I lose my uh, uh, social welfare uh, uh, subscription and medical insurance sub subscription, but also I will lose my residence system. It will be revoked. Um, so basically, Palest especially Palestinians from Jerusalem, because of the status, they avoid living in the West Bank. Uh, unless they are forced to, unless they have no house, no other place, uh, uh, but you can see if you, you know, uh, there are neighborhoods like uh, uh, near Kalandia, actually, that was mentioned in the question, the uh, Kufur Aqab and Samiramis, the ones that I talked about them, that they are behind the wall. There are neighborhoods that are stuffed with Palestinians. There are buildings of, uh, uh, you know, 12 and 15 and 17 and 20 um, floors that are built without permits, by the way, most of them, without any permit, without any zoning and planning, without any uh, uh, good services in these areas uh, uh, for, for the people, but only built for the only reason that they are inside the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem, even though they are outside the wall, but they are inside the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem. And therefore, uh, the Palestinians who live there uh, can continue to to have to, to say that my center of life is in Israel according to the Israeli definition. So many Palestinians move there, uh, and uh, uh, and especially with the mixed marriages of green ID card and blue ID card people, they they like to live in these areas because uh, not they like they are forced in a way to to live in these areas. They are not pleasant areas. Uh, they are very crowded and with no services, and uh, uh, you know. So I, you know, it's it's not. These are not pleasant areas to live in. However, um, some you know people are forced to live there in order to keep the residency status of the one who has a blue ID card, to uh, pass, to be able to pass the status to the children, without having the the, the spouse who has a green ID card looked at home. There are many families who, you know, once they uh, get married and uh, um, the spouse from the West Bank comes to Jerusalem and still does not have a permit, basically they have to lock themselves at home and, you know, or risk movement, uh, you know, move with, with the risk of being caught and uh, uh, being uh, uh, transferred outside Jerusalem by the police uh, and also punished. You know that... You know, one of the restrictions uh, uh, that Israel built when they built the wall, the legal restrictions is, you you are not allowed to carry in your car, in your vehicle, a Palestinian from the West Bank who does not have a permit to uh, to be in uh, in Israel. So if your wife 
or your husband or your father or your mother has a West Bank ID card and uh, they are uh, uh, and you're carrying them in your own car and you have a blue ID card, you are actually committing a crime. It's a crime in Israeli law. So this is the apartheid that we're living in. It is the criminalization of the most simple things. And this is what is creating new areas like Kufar Aqab and uh, Trafat refugee camp, by the way, is also a very crowded area where many Palestinians are forced to live also as a result of these measures. Was that the last question, Prada? Yes. Thank you very oh. much. Uh, Pro Professor Arlini, you can ask if you want the, the last questions. We are finished our class. Uh, so thank you very much one more time, Professor Mui, Nancy, and all the, the students. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank, thanks, Clara. Uh, well, this is like the fourth class in which we have put side by side Munir and Nancy. Uh, experiences in Brazil and Palestine about topics that in some way or another uh, we find uh, 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 certain uh, points of, uh, of identification. You know? uh, watching your your expositions, uh, what really struck me was you know how, how, how um, profound, you know how deep it was to listen to the, the people you interviewed, Nazi in the, in the occupation, New Palestine, New Palestine village occupation. They were talking about human suffering, you know? and and when they were talking about human suffering, uh, even if the political situation is so different, so diverse from Brazil in relation to Palestine, we see how uh, in this in this aspect of uh, uh, they, they really touch. You now they they are experiences, and and so we understand how that these people uh, feel that the name that they gave to the occupation is to their occupation in Gila is, is legitimate. You know, it's it's a new Palestine. They feel that they are living in a type of Gaza Strip, as they described it in the interviews. No, and also Munir, we also had a class, the last class, talking about the MST, the movement that the MTST came from, and they there in that class they explained how the term occupation should not confuse uh, us. No, because they are completely different. When we talk about occupation here, it is the opposite of occupation of the Israeli occupation, which is occupation depriving people of their rights. And here it's an occupation struggling for their rights. No? And so I, I'd like to ask uh, Nancy, now that you also you've heard uh, Munir's uh, uh, exposition and, and all this, uh, you know, that the MTST uh, Munir today has representatives in parliament. Uh, the leader has been practically, uh, uh, you know, running for president. Uh, it's, it's an important movement in Brazil. You know, it's a movement that I would like to know, Nancy, if you have any perspectives of how you could, uh, on, the, on the international level, of how you could uh, do more for Palestine, for this which unites you, for the human suffering that you identify so much with, what could be your actions of the MTST to to, to tackle a problem which in Palestine is essentially a political problem, no? Bom, é, a, já, visto que a gente tem é, representantes no, no Congresso, eu acho que é um, é um caminho importante para reforçar a, o apoio do Brasil à, Palestina, à causa palestina. É, a gente, nesse momento, vive um, grandes dificuldades, a gente vai ter uma CPI, uma investigation about, about MST in the Congress started yesterday. So, we have many problems, but I think uh, you know, any kind of opportunity to us to help Palestine, I think we, we will help. And, I will show, inclusive, my T-shirt. It's uh, the coordination of the uh, new Villa Nova Palestina sell it to help, to support the occupation and to support the Palestinians too. Wonderful, Nancy. So with, with 
yes, it, it's you face problems uh, uh, in the movement, uh, and but you have also your strengths, uh, absolutely, uh, in Congress. Uh, and Munir, what would be uh, your uh, uh, your uh, what idea? You know, what kind of initiative do you think could come from Brazil? Uh, you know, we're talking about movements, the MTST, the, the, they have representatives in parliament. We have, uh, they have structures of power in Brazil and they have structures of power in the people. What could be the initiatives to bring these movements closer to demanding a justice for Palestine? Look, in, um, currently as a human rights movement in Palestine, we are uh, working uh, uh, and hoping that a number of uh, things will be uh, established. We want uh, accountability. We want justice. Uh, and uh, most of the accountability we're looking for as a human rights community uh, comes from abroad, right? It comes from the international community. Brazil is certainly a very important country. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's an... Uh, uh, it's a strong and big country in Latin America, and uh, uh, it can, of course, influence uh, the region in many ways. Uh, and of course, the, the parliament uh, um, will inform uh, or will advise and pressure also foreign policy uh, of, of the state. We really need um, um, uh, uh, support uh, for first recognizing and uh, 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 declaring publicly uh, that you know the apartheid reports uh, have been published recently uh, not every state in the world uh, is using the language uh, yet is uh, expressing that this is an apartheid system that needs to uh, uh, change fundamentally um, from my point of view, and I believe the point of view of many others in the human rights community, it is very important that uh, um, you know uh, that 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 more and more countries are um, expressing this uh, explicitly, and uh, se and therefore also uh, demanding accountability, uh, and uh, at the same time also exercising uh, their own uh, measures uh, against Israel until it stops uh, 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 these violations. Uh, so uh, I believe a lot can uh, uh, can come out of uh, the movement. Basically, observing the policies, I I should admit I haven't really followed very closely uh, the. Uh, what Brazil's positions are today in, let's say, the UN or other places regarding, for example, apartheid or all of that. Uh, but I believe it is very important. Uh, this is maybe something we could uh, examine together and, uh, and think about together and, um, and take forward. And, you know, I'll be honored to be uh, your friend and your partner in, 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 the, uh, in seeking justice for Palestine and for Brazil and uh, uh, for all those who are oppressed uh, around the world because see, uh, indeed, um, injustices uh, like each other, you know, uh, the oppressive uh, people, they like each other and they support each other and they can see that uh, very closely. I saw, for example, when Donald Trump uh, 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 took uh, the position in, in, in the US here, uh, how he, uh, you know, he became very supportive, not only of Israel, but of many other oppressive regimes around the world. Um, and I can see how the right wing people in different places are supporting each other as well, which is weird. Like all right wing people, they think of them as the best, but uh, at the same time, they are supporting other right wing uh, groups. So there is, um, uh, I can see that happening in, in many cases. And I think that uh, the alliance and, uh, and, um, and friendship uh, of, of, of human rights defenders and uh, um, people who are uh, struggling for uh, all different forms of justice, social justice, uh, uh, political uh, uh, and, and self-determination like our case and all of the other, it's very important. So I'm, I'm honored to be your friend and your uh, partner in, in struggling for justice. Great, we'll, we'll exchange those contacts there. Munir, just to finish, our next class is going to be by uh, our colleague Bashir Bashir about the one state, two state. What is your vision from your position? What is your vision for uh, 
way towards a solution in Palestine in terms of state organization? Yeah, look, my personal position uh, is, cert is certainly that I would like uh, uh, to end up with one state rather than two states. Um, of course, today we are living a one state reality that Israel is uh, ruling from the river to the sea, but we are also living the two states reality. At the same time, by the way, so Palestine is a state uh, recognized by the international community as such, acting as such, uh, despite the fact that it is not independent, it is occupied, it is controlled by Israel, but still it has the status of a state in the international uh, arena. And uh, uh, so we are currently in a certain uh, confusion between one state and two states at the same time. That this is the current situation, but it is oppression. It's an oppressive regime, one, one government, one army ruling from you know, the whole territory. Uh, my vision uh, stems from my human rights background. I really believe in human rights. I don't just work in human rights. I believe that we are all equal, uh, that uh, um, we can all uh, share power together. We can all serve our interests together whether you're Jewish, you're uh, Palestinian, whatever your ethnic origin, whatever your religion, whatever your uh, color is, you can, you know, people can work together, can live together and can uh, uh, develop together. You know, it's not one versus the, it shouldn't be one versus the other. Uh, so I believe in a state that has, you know, that's not a really a national state for one group or the other, but, um, uh, but one simple uh, democratic uh, state for everyone. I should mention that there are several um, models that people have thought uh, about for the one state first. You know, for those who believe in one state, uh, there are several models. Uh, I know Bashir Bashir is, uh, is uh, subscribed to a certain uh, model and type. I am uh, also, I believe in a, in, a, in a different one. You know, they are very close and similar to each other, but uh, there are some slight differences. Uh, uh, here and there, I believe more of a, in, in, in a simple state uh, that has, uh, uh, you know, um, that allows everybody to be uh, living equally um, and allows all the refugees to return, very important to return to their homes uh, in what became Israel in 1948 um, and, uh, and, and then to live equally and to decide to determine our future together as a Palestinian and Jewish population. And of course, making sure that everybody is safe and secure and that property is safe and, you know, everything, you know, that's very important, but I believe that everybody should be equal, very simply. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much, Munir, uh, Nancy. So maybe we can uh, uh, keep in touch. It's been very wonderful to, to listen to your explanation about the very important MTST movement. Munir, whenever there's a demonstration here in Brazil, a, a large demonstration for Palestine, the MTST is there. They're always present. They're always uh, together. Uh, so, well, thank you both. And, and Clara, thank you so much for organizing and, 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 and the whole support team for this class and the students. See you next Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.